Hello, everybody, and welcome to Profiling Evil in this premiere. I'm Mike King, and just a few days ago, I was on a podcast with a creator named Stefan Adika at Coffee Talk with Adika Live. Now, for those of you who were fans of Guns N' Roses, Alice Cooper, Eddie Hale, Van Halen, and Kiss, you, you probably know who this wacky guitarist is. I mean, he's amazing on a guitar. He's now the host of a morning talk show. And he surprised me last week by uh, inviting me to come on his show and talk about my book, Deceived. Let's just take a 30-second look at what's happening there, and I hope you'll go over and listen to the entire interview. You're live. You're on the air. It's Coffee Talk with Adika Live, and I am Stefan, your host. Today's guest is, from Profiling Evil on YouTube, Mike King, author of the book called Deceived, an investigative memoir of the Zion Society cult. Bam. Yeah, welcome, Mike, to the studio, my friend. Hey, hey Stefan. Great to see you again. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. And everybody. She confidently stood up and she shook my hand and, and she said, I've been involved in a cult that's sexually abusing children. Do you have a minute to talk to me? He, he was known by every judge, police officer, because he was just always there. Well, I really want to thank Stefan. You know, he surprised me at the end of our discussion by asking about a little-known serial killer. And I thought, what the heck? I mean, it's going to be 72 years ago today that the state of Washington executed this killer. I thought we should talk about this killer and the thing that really brought him fame, something called the Jake Bird Hex. Well, Please take a moment, hit the like and the subscribe button, ring the bell and subscribe so that you get all the notifications when we release videos like this one. Now, today's special because we're going to go live right after this premiere. Well, let's get started. Jake Bird was born in 1901, and we don't know who his parents are. At a very young age, Bird was apparently adopted by a man and woman, Charles and Delly Bird of Louisiana. He was never able to articulate what city he was from, although he was smart enough and charismatic enough to have known. I, I just don't believe it, and I think he just didn't tell people. Anyway, he never shared it. Well, Bird was a drifter, rolling from town to town by way of the railroad. He worked odd jobs, and he even did a stint as a Gandhi dancer for the railroad. Now, Gandhi dancers are the guy who works uh, as a manual laborer, laying down and maintaining the railroad tracks across the country. It was terribly difficult work, and it kept him moving from place to place. Well, along the way, he racked up one heck of a criminal history. By the time he was locked up for good, Berg, who was a burglar, a rapist, and a murderer, had victims strewn across the United States. He would actually do more than 30 years in prison, which is good, but it wasn't good enough. You see, he died at age 48. That means that he had about 18 or 19 years to be a child, an infant, a child, a teenager. But every single moment he had free if those numbers are all accurate, he was out killing people. He, he became one of America's most prolific serial killers. Now, he would get an early release from prison for good behavior, but within days, the killer would savagely attack another unsuspecting victim. He would assault the women before killing them, and sadly, most of his victims were women. There was a display of an incredible amount of overkill as he would bludgeon his victims to death, uh, usually with an axe or some blunt force. Whenever practical, he would then steal whatever he could to make the crime financially beneficial as well. In evaluating his crimes, though, it, it was clear to me that assault and murder were stimulating and really motivating for this killer. The financial gain just made good sense. Well, Bird wasn't the kind of serial killer that law enforcement officers in the 1940s were accustomed to. And it, it would take the murder of a woman named Bertha Clute and her 17-year-old daughter to finally bring a stop to Bird's murderous rampage. On October 20th, 1947, 
Bird was skulking around a neighborhood located one mile west of Tacoma's Washington Railroad. Now, remember, he, he worked on the railroad. So coming into a rail station, that was a great jumping point for him and a way for him to quickly get out of town after committing a murder. Well, he was looking for a home to burglarize, wandering the neighborhood. He needed some extra money to support his gambling habit, and he stumbled across a home that appeared to be unoccupied. Now, in hindsight, all of the murders happened again near these rail yards. It, it, it just makes perfect sense knowing who the killer is, but it would take mapping them all out to make this connection. The process the, of mapping these things and looking at them is known as geographic profiling. And when it's combined with psychological profiling, it can help us better understand the criminals, their movements, and their victim selection process. Well, Bird would later confess to arresting officers that he broke into the home and was surprised by the homeowner, Bertha Clute. She's a 53-year-old uh, woman. He said that Clute attacked him and she wouldn't allow him to leave and he was forced to kill her in order to escape. Well, after killing her, he was threatened by her daughter who woke up during the murder and so he had to, in his words, kill her as well. In other words, it was fight or flight for him. He was covered with the victim's blood and pieces of brain matter. It was a horrible crime scene. Well, closer examination of the scene would reveal a much different story than Bird told. And when we look at it from a behavioral perspective, we begin to paint a picture of what a violent person Jake Bird really was. You see, inside the home, police recovered evidence to support that there was a sexual assault in the mother's bedroom. Now, this would suggest that she was actually the target of Bird's assault. And, and it would have happened in a couple of ways, either through window peeking, this voyeuristic way that burglars often work and, and become sexual predators, or perhaps he discovered her as he was slithering around inside of the home. But either way, he saw her sleeping in her bed, started to fantasize about her, and then committed the sexual assault. Now, it appears that her screams alerted her daughter who came to her rescue. Neighbors also heard her screams, and they called police immediately. Well, between the time of the screams and police arrival, Bird bludgeoned the two women to death with an axe that he either obtained at the scene or brought with him. In many of his murders, he actually took an axe with him to the scene. The physical trauma was so terrible that even the police had a hard time talking about the crime scene. As Bird was fleeing the residence, covered in blood, police were walking up a back alley to the residence. They, they met in the alleyway, and, and a chase ensued over a couple of backyard fences. And finally, the patrol officers cornered Bird, who pulled out a knife, and he ended up cutting one of the officers and stabbing another. Well, to his surprise, the officer that he cut was a retired boxing prize fighter. The officer pummeled Bird, repeatedly landing left hooks to the jaw, followed by kicks to the groin. It came to the point that Bird said he'd had enough and he dropped the knife and was taken into custody. At the police station, he confessed to the murders, but he claimed that it was self-defense as he tried to flee from a burglary. He actually signed his confession, which became a really big issue during his trial. You know, things were so much different back then. Uh, perhaps we were a little more reckless in the criminal justice system, or maybe we were just a lot more efficient. I don't know. But either way, the killer faced a jury trial within a month and 10 days, uh, 40 days from commission of crime to facing a jury. Now, in that trial, a little bit of backstory emerged that I found really interesting. As the defense and prosecution were questioning Tacoma police officer John Hickey, the guy who arrested Bird, along with Officer Russell Scatum, Hickey revealed that uh, he had a momentary lapse of judgment. Hickey would testify, quote, I regret to say that I lost my temper after returning from the Clute home and viewing the terribly hacked bodies of the two women. 
He continued, I had asked Bird as we sat in the patrol rat wagon why he murdered the two women. Bird said he didn't do it. I asked him who did it then, and he said it was Leroy. Who's Leroy, I asked. His response, quote, another Negro around town. Well, the officer replied, you're lying, and, and he said that Bird looked at him with a smug and insolent look. The officer continued and said, I know I shouldn't have done it, but I hit him in the jaw with my fist, knocking him to the front of the patrol wagon. Then I struck him a number of times with my nightstick until he said, don't kill me. That brought me to my senses, and we took him to the hospital where a nurse said he wasn't badly hurt. Holy cow, that comes from a, a old article from the Seattle Post. <laughs> Amazing. Well, without question, folks, I want to say that is police brutality. It was a much different time. That kind of behavior wasn't permitted in my day, and officers today are even under more self-restraint. But, but it does clearly show how difficult it is to keep your emotions in check when you're handling these violent kinds of felony crimes. Well, after the trial ended, and if, by the way, it would only take the jury 35 minutes to hand down their decision, the jury came in one and a half days after the trial began and found Jake Bird guilty of first-degree murder. Moments later, Judge Hodge sentenced the now convicted killer to be hanged at the Washington State Penitentiary on January 16, 1948. That was from the day he committed the murders to the day he was supposed to be executed, only 88 days. Bird was stunned. Frankly, I'm stunned when I, when I look and listen to this. Bird was stunned, and when he had an opportunity to address the court, he said, quote, all you guys who had anything to do with this case are going to die before I do, close quote. Well, I'm going to hold off on telling you the outcome of what became known as the Jake Bird Hex. But I want to talk about what happened next. You see, Bird won a 60-day reprieve from Governor Monrad Walgren by claiming that he could clear up to at least 44 other murders that he either committed or participated in during his travels across the country. He pled with the governor to let him clear his conscience of the crimes he had committed, and the clock started ticking. Well, as the clock ticked, the jailbird sang, and oh, how this guy sang. Jake Bird started confessing, and the cops were listening. The killer shared details that only a killer could know. Uh, before he was executed, he confessed to 44 murders. But then there was one murder in all of those that really jumped out to me. It actually occurred in my hometown in northern Utah where I was a police officer. And wouldn't you know it? It happened in Ogden, a railroad town. It's actually near the site of the Golden Spike, the place where the First Transcontinental Railroad was finally joined, if you remember the pounding of the Golden Spike. The victim, in that case, worked in the rail yards. He was loved by the community. The victim's name was Lee K. Walker, and Jake Bird beat him to death with an axe, just like he did the other 43 people that he killed. It was the 1st of October in 1947 when Lee Walker dropped his wife off at Union Station, the train station, so that she could take a train to Idaho to see her sister. She returned the late afternoon of the 4th of October, and she was really concerned because Lee wasn't waiting for her at the train as she got off. She found a ride home, and she wondered if he was sick. When she walked in the house, she found that the door to the house was unlocked, and this caused her to grow even more concerned. And then her worst nightmare came to fruition as she walked into their bedroom to find his lifeless and badly beaten body on the bed. Now, police didn't have any suspects or leads in this violent murder until Bird confessed. You know, it's amazing to me because I worked the area that this happened in for 30 years. 
<laughs> and it would take a heavy metal rock star named Stefana Dika to teach me about a murder in my own town and that it was done by a serial killer that I'd never heard of. Well, Bird's Confessions brought a throng of investigators from across the nation to interview him at the penitentiary. They positively identified 11 murders, but Bird gave enough probable cause information for law enforcement to assume that 33 others were probably committed by him. Now, they didn't have time to finish uh, investigating those before he was executed, but I, I... I find myself wondering, 44, but how many other homicides did this guy commit that he simply forgot about? You know, what we do know, though, is that he stole the lives of people, mostly women from Illinois, Kentucky, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Kansas, South Dakota, Ohio, Florida, Wisconsin, Michigan, Iowa, and Washington. Well, as he was talking with investigators and confessing to the murders, the court system was chunking along. The Washington State Supreme Court, then the U.S. Court of Appeals, and finally the U.S. Supreme Court rejected his petitions for a new trial. And then the early morning hours of July 15, 1949, Jake Bird was taken from his gallows level uh, jail cell to the hangman's noose. It was 25 minutes after midnight as 125 people watched the, the noose be placed around his neck. And as that uh, gallows trap door dropped, so did Jake Bird. He was buried in an unmarked grave on the prison property with the only indication of who it was, number 21520, as the only thing identifying the, the tombstone. His personal assets of $6.15 were was given to the attorney who filed his appeals. So here's the big question. What happened following the Jake Bird hex in the courtroom on the day he was convicted? Now, if you recall, he uttered, Quote, all you guys who had anything to do with this case are going to die before I do. He went on and said, actually, I'm putting the Jake Bird hex on all of you. Anyone who had anything to do with my being punished. Mark my words, he said, you will die before I do. Close quote. Well, according to public record and, of course, some urban legend, but I did document this, six people connected with the trial actually did die. The judge, Edward D. Hodge of Pierce County Superior Court, died on January 1st, 1948 at the age of 69, just shortly after the trial. Then the undersheriff, Joseph Karpach, the Pierce County undersheriff, died on April 5th, 1948 at the age of 46. The court reporter, George Harrigan, died on June 11, 1948. He was 69. The Tacoma police detective who got a confession from him, Sherman Lyons, died on October 28, 1948, at the age of 46. And then Bird's defense attorney, who Bird was mad at and said didn't do anything to help him, James Selden. He died on November 26, 1948, at the age of 76. Now, this is documented in the Tacoma News Tribune, and they would report that all of the men died from heart attacks. Now, today, we would make that a conspiracy, and we would build some kind of a show around it. But a sixth man, a Washington State Penitentiary guard, who was assigned to death row and to take care of Bird, died of pneumonia two months before Bird's execution. So, so there you go. I hope you've enjoyed this premiere on the railway axe murderer, Jake Bird. <laughs> Folks, please take a moment, hit that like and the subscribe button and ring the bell so that you receive all the notifications on videos like this one. But like always, here's a question for you. Do you believe Jake Bird was responsible for the 44 murders that he confessed to? Are there more? And what are your thoughts on the Jake Bird hex? 
I'm going to really enjoy reading your comments on this one down below. I look forward to chatting with you on, on uh, other lives and uh, want to thank you so much for your support of Profiling Evil. We'll see you soon at the next crime scene. Thank you.